Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Andrea Damascelli from UBC to be our Kindness Matter seminar speaker today. Uh, Andrea got uh, his PhD uh, from Stanford with uh, Ziek Shen. Actually, it was, uh, was in Groningen. The PhD was in Groningen. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I, but you, you were in Stanford Postdoc. as a postdoc. There we go. I stand corrected. Uh, <laughs> and uh, from that point on, uh, he went to UBC, I believe, again in the, in the 90s. Um, 2002. Almost 20 years. Yeah. OK, so this is only the second mistake of my introduction, but let's see how far it goes. <laughs> uh, since 2002, um, Andrea has been uh, on the faculty of uh, uh, UBC, uh, where he's a professor of physics. and. Uh, He's been very active in various areas of strongly quarry systems, uh, particularly on the um, on the cuprates and uh, related and oxides and uh, related uh, physics on superconductivity, including also on the ion-based uh, superconductors. He also directs um, the Quantum Matter Institute at UBC, and I must uh, mention this. Uh, that for those of you who sail in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Andrea sails across the Pacific, and uh, uh, I imagine he's doing physics when, when sailing, I'm sure. <laughs> so on that note, uh, I'll turn the uh, floor over to, um, to Andrea, please. Uh, Thanks, so I'll uh, share my screen. So let me know if, uh, for one, two things. One is I won't be able to see if you have questions, so just, just stop me, interrupt yeah. time, uh, because yeah. in the way I'm arranged, I'm not able to see the participant or anyone raising a hand. The second one is my volume sometimes does funny things by mic. Let me know if all of a sudden I disappear. Okay. In any case, please stop me. Uh, I have to, I'm not able to share though. Um, so oh, you cannot share the screen? No. No, you should be able to. It says that host disabled, per, you know, participant screen sharing. So uh, let's do, let's see, I should be able to make you a co host. I just did. So try again. Okay. No, it's good now. Okay. Great. We're seeing you. Your sites. And so please stop me. Yeah, stop me anytime if you have any any question because uh, um, uh, yeah, happy to answer questions during the talk. So thanks, uh, uh, Ximiao, and thanks, Ming and Emilia, for, for the invitation opportunity. And uh, yeah, as, as Ximiao mentioned, we are UBC physics, but also into the Quantum Matter Institute. And you know, we have look at your, our institute and your center. We had a seminar last summer to explore possible collaboration. So, in this particular talk, I will, uh, I will talk, of course, about photoemission and what we can do uh, on, on materials with this technique. But particularly, I will be looking at uh, doing photoemission in a, in a time-resolved fashion, so pump and probe experiments. And as topics, I, have, uh, I will show some, some of, the, of the kind of topics I, I more commonly work on, so cuprates and superconductivity. But towards the end, at the beginning, I'd like to, do, to introduce these approaches using a, a, a simpler system, so graphite. And uh, I'm in particular referring to a work that was published last year, which is the culmination effectively of 10 years of work in our lab. In addition to the Quantum Matter Institute here at UBC, we also have the Max Planck UBC U Tokyo Center for Quantum Materials. And that's basically the free logos you see down on the bottom right. And so this is a center that was started in 2012 and effectively is also what uh, gave the, you know, the impetus to, to start the Quantum Matter Institute. So the university, uh, uh, responding to a, 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 a proposal by the Max Planck Society created a quantum matter institute to actually host the, uh, the, the International Max Planck Center. So the two came up together and in about five years ago we received a very large funding as our Canadian Institute from the federal government. So that really has sort of uh, you know, changed the way we can do research here at, at QMI. So as for you know, introduction to, to the topic is gonna to be about photoemission and electronic structures. And in particular, eventually, what can we learn what we do instead of conventional equilibrium spectroscopy, do spectroscopy in, the, in, in, uh, in, in a time result fashion. What I'm showing here is uh, the, you know, as an introduction, I'd like to really use the work 
recently done by one of my students who just graduated and who is now looking to go to Berkeley to work with James and Alitis. His name is Ryan Day, and uh, he has published uh, a, a recent paper uh, on, on this reference here, which is about a software is developed called Chinook in uh, you know, the honor of the largest Canadian salmon, uh, which is uh, you know, basically allowing you to go from the modeling of electronic structure all the way to what can, one can measure in a photo emission experiment. And I give a couple of examples. So as a starting point, uh, of course, we, we, what we're looking at is the electronic structure in a solid. And you know, here is a simple way where you can go from an atom all the way to a molecule, forming molecular uh, orbitals and bonds all the way to a solid where now you have uh, a periodic arrangement of your lattice. Uh, you have uh, allowed and disallowed bands uh, for electronic states. But of course, what we're most interested in is to look at how these bands uh, develop in momentum space. As you go from your single atom or molecule to a solid, the biggest change that happens in material is the development of a new quantum number, which is the momentum. So the crystal momentum for a particle. And that is what we are after with uh, the techniques we are gonna be using. So in order to do that, the technique is angle result for the mission. And uh, what, what it, in a simple, you know, very simple pictorial description, you have the photon impinging on a sample. The photon will be absorbed by the electrons. This is the you know, Einstein's uh, photoelectric effect. And what we do then we go and collect uh, all of those electrons with an electron analyzer. And what we record are actually two experimental quantities, the kinetic energy of those electrons, as well as the emission angle of the electrons. And of course this technique, you know, since the time that uh, has developed, has matured, and has now become a, a very and high uh, efficient technique. And basically, the two quantities experimentally measured are kinetic energy of those electrons and the angles. And by using energy and momentum conservation, we can then infer what is the binding energy of the electron in the solid, as well as going from the momentum of an electron vacuum, we can go to the momentum of the electron in the solid. So that's basically in a nutshell what the technique does. You can go back to that momentum resolve electronic structure and infer both the binding energy and the momentum of those electrons. Effectively, we can visualize the motion of the electrons in a solid. And of course, then you can convert those, those angles into momenta, and now you have a, a, a dispersion that you have measured. Here is the chemical potential. So effectively, we only measure the occupied part of the electronic structure. We don't see the unoccupied, but then we can go and match the experiment with a calculation. Now, uh, one part of the of the of this of this technique, which is all the, always emphasized, and I'll do a little bit of that, is uh, is uh, to really formally describe it. And so, the intensity of the photoemission uh, experiment can be described in terms of an excitation spectrum. This is what we call the spectral function. It's pretty much the, and is, is shown here in more detail. I'll say a few words about that. But this is basically the single particle excitation spectrum, or also known as the single electron removal. So what is the excitation spectrum of a solid when you remove one electron at a time? And, and this is being probed with a certain probability, which is this term in front here, which we're gonna discuss in a second, which are called the matrix elements. So it's the probability of a transition with uh, the photon field from an initial to a final state. As for a spectral function, I really describe the excitation in the solid. Usually those are written in terms of a self-energy. So the self-energy really captures any uh, co you know, correction effects, uh, with respect to a single, to a, a non-interacting system. So let me just explain what this means. See, well, here you see momentum and energy. In red, you see a dispersion. This would be a simple parabolic dispersion for some electron, almost free electron like in a solid. If there was no interaction, so these electrons really behave as single particles and they didn't interact with each other, then what you would find is a set of delta function in this experiment that would follow precisely that single particle dispersion. However, if interaction become dominant, what we're gonna see is a renormalization of the energy and the, which is here shown by the, the black uh, intensity. And at the same time, the electron goes from having an infinite lifetime, so being a delta function to have a finite lifetime, so gaining a finite width. And so that's basically what in this particular spectral function is captured by in a Fermi liquid type modeling by an imaginary part of a, sorry, a real part of a self energy that gives you the energy renormalization and an imaginary part of a self energy that gives you the life, lifetime, which depends on the frequency of the state as well as on the temperature. So basically, you know, if you look at the difference between the, bl the black intensity shown there and the red line, which is a single particle picture, this is really the effect of the self energy. And that's what this technique can really directly by, by this comparison give you. 
with uh, uh, with Ryan, what we've done, and in fact, we, we students before him, we started a long time ago, we really looked into what can we learn if we uh, look at these matrix element terms uh, and use polarization in the geometry of experiment uh, to, to probe our state and see what we can tell, for instance, about the orbital character of these states. Well, the simplest one is to say that, you know, you may have an odd orbital as an initial state or an even orbital. And now you come in with light. This is a photon field, which could be polarized in this case, horizontally or vertically, and then ask which state are you going to probe? And so in this particular case, if one looks at this um, integral, in order to, for the integral to be zero, it means that you can only probe with a, 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 a not feel like this when you can only probe an odd initial state. So you would gain intensity from these orbitals and not from the other one. So in practice, what it means, you have an experiment in here done on the other arsenides that Ming-He has done so much work on. And, uh, and you can see that, you know, you have uh, two bands here and you can mean with vertical or linear polarization, sorry, horizontal polarization. And you will see either one band prominently or the other band. And of course though, uh, this is where the strength of the, of the software, the code developed by, by our group uh, comes in, where we now say, yes, of course you can learn about this particular, uh, you know, a, a distinction between symmetry of, a, of an initial state of the orbital, but in fact, there is much more you can do. And so, in fact, if you know what you see here, the simulation of the states, and you can see all of the details of how this intensity is, is transferred from one band to the other one, and that is really uh, polarization effect in the presence of spin orbit coupling, where you have mixing of states here. And so instead of having continuous intensity along one, some of it is transferred to the other. Uh, but at the same time, you can really learn all of the details of this wave function as done in, in this particular case. So it's extremely powerful. So you will learn about the symmetry of your state, you will learn about the, the, the mixing of spin and orbital and so on. Now, just as a, as a uh, Final uh, information about this, you can find the software online, it's an open, an open source software. And pretty much you start off from a DFT calculation, you go to a tie binding model, uh, basically through a Bernier orbital uh, uh, you know, the projection descriptions, and then you will, you will go and calculate your, uh, your, in a given experimental configuration, you can go evaluate your matrix elements and compare with the, with the theory. And so in this particular case, you know, you go from a model system, all the way to simulating the intensity. And then you have various you know, parameters you can vary. In this particular case, again, of the iron arsenide is the splitting between the XC and the, the YZ or XY orbitals. And, and that immediately has a role in how uh, spin orbit affects the electronic structure, the spin orbit interaction as you move level with respect to each other. And, and you can see directly in the, in the simulation. And of course, we go and, and compare that to an experiment. Andrea, if I can interrupt you. Um... I think Doug has a question in the chat. Doug, you want to ask? Yeah, I just, from your description on the previous slide, I just want to make sure I understand what you mean by horizontal and vertical polarizations. Like, you know, what, what's your coordinate system when you talk about polarizations here? Depends really on the experiments you're doing, right? So in this particular case, it's, uh, so this is, so in, in, if you look at the experiment, then you have to look at how the sample is oriented. And so then the, the defining, a plane of reference in an experiment like this would be the emission plane. So let's imagine that you know you are measuring electrons coming off the sample in a horizontal emission plane, and your sample has its axis well aligned with it. Now you can go and in, in that particular image define your horizontal and vertical polarization in that context. In reality, the software allows you to calculate. So if I, to calculate uh, your photo emission intensity for whatever orientation, basically you're going to define what is the emission plane for the electrons, what is the sample orientation. And now you can go and calculate uh, what would be if you the intensity if you move the emission plane or if you rotate the sample, so which are not equivalent. So you really can calculate, let's say, a three-dimensional, uh, a three-dimensional uh, dependence, angular dependence of the emission intensity. Once you know the incoming polarization, the incoming photon energy, and the sample orientation. Great, thank you. Yeah. So in this in this case, just take it as a very simple. You know, there is a plane of reference which is this one so this this polarization is odd with respect to this plane however if it was rotated by 90 degrees would be would be even with respect to that plane okay so then uh as a last slide yes a lot of examples that we have treated with this so this is all in this paper you know you start off from your modeling you go to an arpa simulation this is again the iron arsenide case that ryan has worked on 
but you can also simulate the full KZ dispersion of a solid, which is what we're doing now, combining the simulation with our experiment on, on the iron arsenides as a function of photon energy, but also disorder systems, spin resolved photon emission, and all of that, including topological state. A everything really can be simulated with this software. So I really encourage you know people who are in, 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 in this kind of the research to use it and, and come back to to request him to us and also suggestion for improvements. So, so Andrea, can I uh, ask a question about that? Yep. In practice, how many uh, how many bands can you include in a tie binding fitting, or is that is that pretty much a limit? No, no, no. We we actually so in, in as far as going to uh, hopping terms. So when we yeah. Our uh, our our matrices, uh, type binding matrices, we usually have hundreds of terms. Okay. So depending on the complexity of, uh, so basically that had to do with optimizing uh, uh, the code so that you could do this fast. Uh, mm -hmm. But basically, for when you, we look at routinates, we look at topological insulators. Uh, you can find on our on the PRLs the the Hamiltonians we used back then, and it's hundreds of mm -hmm. terms. And then That's we cool. yeah, do that, and we do, for instance, in the case of uh, routinates, or also here, a projection on those orbital-like states, so that we can give a physical meaning. We can associate now a specific physical meaning to the evolution of intensity. In, in physical meaning, I mean in terms of atomic orbitals that you can, you know, visualize in your mind. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So now let me move to to. Okay, that was all for animation and, and equilibrium. So what about time domain? Well, time domain means that now instead of a single photon coming onto the sample, we have two photons. We have a in this case an infrared uh, beam, the red beam, which comes in and excites your sample. And as, at a given delay, there is a second photon that comes in a probe the sample. So basically, what we're trying to do now. Uh, is not only to look at the excitation of the system at equilibrium, but excite the system, look at what changes in the excitation, and see how the system relaxes. Uh, this is work which really has uh, has been challenging because of the development of this particular source. And this has taken about 10 years, and I'll, I'll give you more details about that. But pretty much we have to now use lasers because we're lo looking at a, uh, we need a time structure for these photons, which is faster than what a synchrotron would give you, so it has to be developed using lasers. And the challenge in using laser is to take them up to photon energy large enough that you can do a meaningful work in solids. And so we have started this work in about 10 years ago, and it's only the last two years that really the output is coming. And I'd really like to emphasize this was initiated by a grant from the Canadian federal government, uh, but later was supported by the Moore Foundation in the last three years with a, with a large infrastructure grant. But also this is you know, critical to or central to the activity of the Max Planck UBC Center and also the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. As for this group, this work is really the work of two groups, my own group on the spectroscopy side and David Jones group on the laser development side. And, and the place we, you know, the lab where we do this is, is now called the UBC Moore Center for Ultrafast Quantum Matter because of the, you know, thanks to that, that grant that made it possible, those two grants that made it possible. And the work I'm going to describe is primarily the one of uh, Katie, a student in my group, and was published in Science last year, done in collaboration with Art, who is a senior scientist in, in David's group. So really, this is the work of two groups would not be possible otherwise. Time resolved for the mission. We have many different examples already. So this is a technique that I think is, uh, you know, uh, coming out of infancy in, in, in the last few years because of the development of sources. And so here is one of the first papers in this field, which really I don't want to, I'm not going to describe it, but basically looks at a charge density wave system, a system that will, you know, go from a room temperature structure into a low temperature structure where you have folding of bands into the charge order. And the idea is now you can come in with a pump a very strong pump perturb the system and melt that long range order that described the low temperature phase and then see how the system recover. And so this way you can really learn about the microscopic, the phenomenology of, of these kind of phase transitions and drive them. The second one, also very interesting effort, is the one of Andrea Cavalleri, where now it comes in on, uh, on uh, superconductors, like here you see uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, or here C60, potassium dope C60, and now use the, optic, uh, the optical beam to try to enhance superconductivity. So now here we are in a situation where ideally, uh, and this is one of the claims, that by driving the system, using in particular a photon energy for the pump, which is resonating for some of the key phonon modes of the system, you could push the system to a, a regime of transient superconductivity, which may exceed the superconductivity 
uh, superconducting transition temperature usually is in the system and perhaps push all the way to room temperature. And I think the game here is see whether you can sustain a transient superconductivity over a long enough time scale that may be useful for some applications. So I think the goal is to aim for nanoseconds in this case. Another one, and this is work by Ziyech Shen, so my former postdoc advisor and, and also advisor of, of Ming Yi, is to now use uh, pump and probe to photo dope, uh, photo dope your, your unoccupied or populate effectively your unoccupied electronic structure. So here you see working topological insulators where you have a chemical potential down here. So electrons occupy this region of the spectrum. However, if you excite them in the unoccupied part and you have enough signal to noise, which is really the key here, you can go and monitor that unoc unoccupied structure in a spectacular way. Last one, again, work done by ZX's uh, group and, uh, and uh, Kirkman, who is a senior scientist in his group, is work that combines photo emission done time results. So here you see a sketch on an arsenide superconductor. Now you have photo emission. Uh, basically, you have a, your infrared pump beam that comes in, and then you're going to have two probe beam. One is a 6 CV photon that we use to do the photo emission experiments, or they use. And here is your ARPIS analyzer. And on the same sample, albeit not in the same experimental setup, you can also come in with a kilo electron volt photon, so X-rays, and do a diffraction experiment in, in, in time resolved fashion. So here is a, a you know basically uh, the uh, time evolution, so time here, uh, and the X-ray intensity. What it means here is that what we're looking at is a particular Bragg peak in your diffraction spectrum and see an oscillation of the Bragg peak. So basically you come in with a photon, excites the system. You can follow this oscillation in time, which tells you about how the structure is being modulated. And at the same time, you can look at the band structure and see the modulation of the electronic states. And from the comparison of the two techniques here, uh, and basically a detailed density functional theory analysis, they infer what the relevant electron photon couplings are in this particular material. So going from now really it's an experiment to the very detailed microscopic interpretation uh, of the data. And that's actually where our work also comes in. And uh, the idea is uh, to really look at electron photon coupling and you see if there is a way that we can extract that with minimal modeling uh, from, from the data. And of course, electron photon coupling as a phenomenon is, is the foundation for many uh, you know, different properties of matter like charge density waves or superconductivity and so on. Now, the question is, how can we you know, obtain estimates for electron photon coupling? So ab initio calculation is, is one approach, which of course works in systems which are well described by density functional theory. But as soon as correlation becomes strong, it's, it's more challenging. Scattering experiment, particle, neutron, or photons. However, in this case, you can follow now for the phonon spectrum uh, a specific mode with a specific Q. But if you look at your interaction with the electrons, it's usually integrated over all uh, momenta for the electronic structure. Or you can do photoemission. And uh, in photoemission, it's the opposite. So in photoemission, what you can do is something you know, depicted right here, where you see again binding energy, momentum, chemical potential. You see a band dispersion. This is actually graphene, should be a linear band, but you see that there is a deviation from linearity around this region shown again here where the orange line are the maximum of this curve and in black you have a straight line which should be the graphene dispersion so the, basically the you know the dft calculation for graphene and that deviation is a self-energy correction which you can quantify as a real part of the self-energy and you can through an alpha square f type analysis so you can actually relate that deviation to the electron photon coupling of the system however when you do this now you're looking at electron with a specific momentum and the electron photon coupling is integrated over all possible uh, uh, vibrational modes of the system. So again, the question is, can we do something different? Can we do it in, uh, in, uh, in a way that, it, that tells you both about the electron momentum and the photon momentum? And can we also do it in a way which is perhaps more reliable? And I'll show you what I mean with that. And so then the, the key is, can we do it, for instance, in the time domain? Can we get this electron photon coupling directly in the time domain, for instance, by locking an electron photon scattering time for a given electron in a given mode and extract from that in an electron photon metric cell. Now, the, the analysis I just referred to in photomission is called the kink analysis uh, and, and has been uh, you know, developed in the last 20 years very accurately, but there are some issues with that. 
So let me go a little bit in what are the typical issues in doing this kind of analysis. Here is a case for graphene. Uh, and uh, here is doping levels for graphene. Uh, in uh, in uh, the dash line here would be what DFT tells you. And for lambda, the electron phonon coupling, or let's say the, you know, the mass enhancement associated with electron phonon coupling is no longer the G I was referring to before. And so here are your, your DFT results, and here are the experimental results over the years by many different groups. And you see how big is the spread and how far it is from uh, the actual expectation. And so here is, there are many different aspects. One is, you know, resolution is a big effect, especially when the values are small. Uh, how do you obtain the bare band dispersion you want to compare it to? For graphene, it would be a simpler case, but however, all these experiments done with graphene on some substrate, and so there is, a, there is an effect coming from that too. Even more uh, concerning is the simple consideration and as an example, the one of cuprates, of course, which I am uh, more familiar with or spend much of my time with. Here is uh, for bismuth cuprates. So this is the uh, most intensively studied bismuth cup uh, cuprate by photo emission. Uh, here you see as a function of doping. So around here is optimal doping for the system how the electron phonon coupling is obtained from this kind of analysis going down in doping. And here is the normal state, and here is a superconducting state. And you see values of lambda, which are sort of extrapolating to a, a staggering value of 10, which of course is very unrealistic. So here the issue is in all this analysis, what, what we always do is assume that the self-energy terms are all additive so that you have correlations coming from the electrons. On top of that, you're gonna be correlation coming from uh, electron phonon interactions and impurities and so on. Problem is, and it has to do that these, these, these corrections are not additive. Here you should start from a Hamiltonian, look at your interaction, your, you look at your self-energy, and you would see that all these, these terms in the self-energy actually do really normalize each other. And so that's where, you know, couplings are strong, electron electron interactions are strong. That's where this analysis gets particularly difficult. So that was the idea. Can we go with a simpler approach? And as a bench, you know, mark sample, we will use graphite. And nowadays we're working on the correlated systems. To set the stage, let me start off with uh, graphene. So as, as a model system. So in graphene, basically you would have a Dirac-like cone, lower and upper Dirac cone. The idea of the experiment is that, you know, you're taking your system is, is, is populated all the way to the Dirac point. So occupy states here, unoccupied states there. You come in with an infrared beam, the photon get excites electrons up in the unoccupied band structure. And now we could look at how these electrons decays, uh, decays emitting uh, uh, a, a phonon in the system. So if you do a simulation for what the intensity would look like, here it is, you, you do photo emission, you, you see electrons coming from uh, the, 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 the lower part of the data cone, but at t equals zero, you have two pump, pump and, and probe coming together. You're also populating uh, states at, you know, above a chemical potential. And those is what we call the dire transition population. If you wait long enough, you're going to see that some of these intensities transfer down along this particular, along the upper branch of, of the cone uh, at an energy which corresponds to the energy of a photon on a time scale, which is electron photon scattered in time. And so very simply, you look at this relation and you could say that if you can measure this electron photon scattering time very accurately for a given Q mode, well, then you directly have your mode projected electron phonon matrix elements, or if you like, you can also get the electron phonon coupling constant. So that's the idea. Now, the problem is when you would do, want to do an experiment like this, uh, now you have very stringent requirement coming for the expert. And the problem is the following. The Dirac cone in graphene or graphite is located at the corners of a very large Brillouin zone. And that basically means that here are what you, what you need to do. But the key element is being able to photomit an electron from there. And that means uh, transferring enough energy to that electrons from the photon so that the momentum is large enough to get there. So the, the kinetic energy is large enough. And in other words, it means that if I work with a 6CV laser, which is very common in this, in this field, you're going to be very limited to the amount of momentum you can probe for the electronic excitations. And in fact, you'll be stuck close to the gamma point. So to go comfortably to the, to the zone boundary for graphite or graphene, you really have to work around 25 EV photon energy. And so then when it comes to the source, you need photon energy 
over, you know, in excess to 20 V, you need, because you want to look at electron phonon uh, interactions, you need, you need resolution which are better than 100 MeV to be comparable to that. And you also need scattering time, which are reasonably, uh, you have to look at you know, reasonably fast scattering time, so reasonably good at time resolution. And that's where the challenge comes from. So this work was done by David Jones and his group uh, over the last uh, 10 years, the development of a source, which is basically a cavity-based higher modern generation source. So it's based on enhancement cavity. You drive a cavity, and in particular, you have photons going through a gas jet, but you drive a cavity coherently so that you store, you know, you have very little uh, peak power uh, into, this, into these pulses, but you have a lot of power stored in the cavity. You have higher repetition rate. We are looking at 60 megahertz repetition rate. And effectively this way, you can generate many photons per second, even though each pulse has very few photons. And you can go to very high energy. Here, a picture is a picture of different harmonics. So we go all the way up to, depending on what gas we use, argon, krypton, or sorxenon, up to 40 electron volts. That's where we go these days. And so by a technique like this, we have generated, you know, in this particular experiment, 25 dB photon energy, time resolution of 190, combined of pump and probe, energy resolution of about 20 MeV and repetition rate of 60 megahertz. And this is key because as we've seen in previous example, when you look at the unoccupied electronic structure, you really wanna see the very light, you know, very weak signals. As for what's out there in this case, well, this is our lab where you have our ARPAS chamber. We have an, a VXUV laser, so up to 40 V. We have a 60 V laser, both of them come in in the same chamber. And if you look at what are the key element, the resolution in time, the resolution in energy. Of course, there are you know, major facility like free electron laser and, 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 uh, and large laser facilities. And there you would be looking at much faster time scale, but of course you, give a, you pay a price in energy resolution. So depending on what you want to do, uh, different possibilities are available. And let me just make clear, this is a work from ZX's group, is a, is a review paper on what's available. These are all recent papers in the last few years of higher money generation in gases. So you, will see, you can see here how vibrant a field this is. This is all laser-based, and then you have X-ray and free electron laser. And the key uh, numbers to look at here are the photon energy, so ranging from you know, nine all the way to 40 electron volts. Well, and also kilo electron volts, but you know, for this kind of the purpose of these experiments, that is the range. And then you look at your temporal and energy resolution. So we are here with 20 MeV energy resolution. Then you can see how, of course, you know, the 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 higher, you know, the, there is a, a direct connection between uh, between the time and energy resolution. The higher is the the time resolution, the lower is going to be the energy resolution but also the repetition rate comes in as a key factor here, because when you work at kilohertz, you will need very large powers to see an effect because your repetition rate is very low. When you work at megahertz, now you can afford very low peak powers and see very weak effects. So really there is a variety of tools which are coming online for these experiments. Okay, let me go to the experiment now on graphite. So this is uh, the, the scheme of the experiment. Here are the data. We have chemical potential. We see a direct light cone. Uh, and this is before the pump comes in. Now you're gonna notice that there is a lot of intensity on one side of the cone as a vanishing intensity on the other side. And this is exactly the matrix element effects that we can calculate if we know the geometry of the experiment, the photon energy and the polarization of the light and, uh, and of course the electronic structure of the material. So this can be simulated very accurately. Now we come in zero femtosecond means pump and probe are coincident. And what you see, well, there is some enhancement of intensity above the chemical potential, grant a very weak effect. You can take the difference between these two spectra and obtain in blue a suppression of population, so a depletion below the chemical potential because you're taking electrons from here and exciting them above the F, and you have an increase of population uh, above the chemical potential, electrons that weren't there before. Now, the issue though is that we would like to see something like this. We would like to see a peak above a chemical potential and potentially some structure associated with relaxation involving photons. So now one has to just look at this case here. So we come in with 1.2 EV photon energy. So we photoexcite from minus 0.6 EV to plus 0.6 EV. So really what we'll be looking at is something which would be up here, but you already see that there is very little to be seen down there. And the issue is that the intensity up here is about four order of magnitudes weaker than the chemical potential. So what I'm showing here is basically now, if you go and zoom in there, 
And what you see is some structure writing a, a tail of, of electrons, which are the uh, you know, electron that relax through electron electron. Uh, scattered. So basically what we're doing, we excite those electrons. Some of them we relax through emission of a, of a, of a phonon, but some of them we relax through electron electron scattered. So what you're seeing is this tail, but really what we are interested in this is the structure. So what we're going to do now is subtract the background and concentrate on these peaks that we see here. And just keep in mind, this is extremely weak intensity, four order of magnitude less than you can see the chemical potential. And that's why, you know, uh, two things are key. One is, well, you're playing with an energy range where there is no signal. All of this signal you see there is what you put there by photo excitation. The second one, you need an extremely high repetition rate to get the signal to noise to do this experiment in time, in a, in a, you know, to make it possible, really. So let me go to the interpretation of what we're seeing here. Seeing is basically, this is a scheme, uh, but of course, you know, there is more peaks than we expected to some degree. And well, one has to now go and look in detail of the electronic structure of, of graphite and realize there are more bands in there and realizing that the range I'm showing here is this one. And so there are actually two peaks that one should be expecting. So the intensity here is calculated with Chinook, our program. So we calculate what are the optically allowed transition and presumably, and also what is the intensity of those transitions. So here they are. Those are the two that we expect. And so we call them the direct, um, transition population one and two. Uh, of course, we don't have only, you know, we have a full time dependence on these traces. So in blue, these are the two peaks that you show there and, uh, you know, just a fit of the data that we have. Now there is a third feature in there and that's the interesting one. So, but let's first have a look at how these two peaks evolve in time. You see as a function of delay, you can look at the intensity in these peaks, the Laurentians basically of this analysis. And you see that they come at the maximum, and this maximum for both of them is at time zero. That's where the two pumps and probes, the two pulses are coincident. And keep in mind, pumps and probe both at the width, which is why you see something which has a certain rise time and decay time. Now, the third peak is the interesting one because, well, it's going to be looking very different. So these two are just purely electronic transitions, both allowed, and they follow the same dynamics. But if we now look at the third one, the dynamic is very, is quite a bit different. So the third peak is weaker for one thing, but it comes up with a delay of about 40 femtoseconds as compared to uh, the coincidence between pump and probe. And so this time delay is significant, but also the energy position is significant because this energy is precisely the energy of a K phonon of graphite. So now we have a structure that has a proper energy as well as a time, which is delayed with respect to uh, where the, the population is introduced into the system. So what we can do next is analyze this data and the curves you see below are what we obtain from a rate, you know, a rate equation type analysis where we have a pump that comes in, introduces a population on these transitions, and then we have scattering through electron-electron interactions, but also through electron phonon. And, and so that goes and puts population in here. And that's how the, the, the analysis is done. By doing an analysis on all of, the, all of the structure, you can analyze all peaks simultaneously. And now you can infer that the electron scattering scattering time is not simply this 40 femtosecond delay, but is actually coming out of those rate equations is of the order 170 femtoseconds. And an electron-electron scattering time is of the order of 50, 60 femtoseconds. So from all of those, now you have all of the numbers you need to go and calculate your uh, electron funnel matrix element G. And so this is the experimentally calculated directly from this tau, you know, this tau Q. And then you can compare it to the value calculated from DFT. This is work of uh, Lex Kemper, uh, in, uh, who is one of our collaborators in this paper. And then, then you have the, you know, the experimental value and the calculated value. I'm about to, so please let me know if you have any question on this and how we do the analysis. I'm about to move into more quantitative comparison and then conclude. But the key point is that this is really coming from an experiment, uh, which is very direct, allows you to look at the time scales, and then all of you're doing is a modeling of the data through rate equations. So it's pretty, you know, it's all pretty straightforward, and then you can get a G value out of that. Now, which modes? Well, 165 MeV is the energy of a mode, so you can go to your funnel spectrum here shown and find where this mode is. And this is indeed the K mode of, of, uh, of graphite. And basically means that you have an electron over here in one of the Dirac cones being excited. And now this electron can relax 
with a mode which is a K mode, so it goes from one cone to the next, so from K to K prime type scattering and pays in energy under 65 MeV. And, uh, and here you see in, in color the electron photons coupling calculation, and this is particularly strong in yellow for this mode. But of course, you could also have gamma modes relaxing down, and that's what the, you know, basically uh, you would find with a different energy uh, at, up here at 195 MeV, almost 200 MeV photon energy. And the question is, how strong is the coupling? Those are also co strongly coupled. But so it turns out that if you look at, oh, sorry, if you look at those modes, you know, the coupling is about 50% of that of a K mode. And so we are now working on it. And it seems that we may see that too, but it's a much weaker effect in the spectrum. Finally, uh, from the G values that we can that we obtain, we can also go calculate the lambda value. And here I want to refer a little bit back to the graphene work now, because of course, uh, what we have to do now is, is calculate this lambda value for uh, a, a, a doping level comparable to where we were working at. So here, if you look at lambda versus doping, we were working about 0.6 EV above the F. And so these data, which are not available on graphite, but these data from graphene, uh, were done in Lanzara's group and the calculation are from Calandra. And uh, in this particular calculation uh, analysis, they were able to, through a kink analysis to extract the number. And so here you see something that now once the resolution is taken into account, once graphene is grown on copper to reduce the effect of the substrate and so on and reduce effective correlations, there is a good match. And so the question is where are our numbers? So if we look here, the lambda from theory and experiment there is of the order of 0.035 we measure 0 0.018, so a factor of two less. And it's actually interesting because as I was mentioning, in this technique, the kink analysis, you actually measure the integrated electron photon coupling for all modes, but we are very selective. So we only look at the K point one. So it is you know, the fact that our value for only one of the mode comes out to be half of the integrated value is actually I think, quite, quite, a, quite a, in, a, in good agreement with what you should expect. So in conclusion of this work, basically, uh, what, I, what we can say is that, you know, we have a very accurate way of getting the extremely weak values of, of uh, electron photon coupling. And this can be done in a way which is, you know, specific for a certain K mode and specific for a certain uh, Q momentum for the photo. photo sorry. So... Now, of course, one thing that we would like to do is now we, we just probe one particular mode. And so one particular case state, uh, we would like to use as a pump energy, something where we can go and scan the entire branch of the cone so that we, you know, as the symmetry of the states changes and we go along the, uh, along, the mode, along the cone itself, the symmetry of the, of the electronic state changes, the coupling to, you know, different modes will become allowed and so on, so that we can probe all of that. And this is ongoing work where we basically use, instead of a, a set photon energy for the pump, we use a, a, an optical parametric oscillator and, uh, you know, and different frequency generation to go down as low as possible in, in energy. And it is also, of course, important if we now start doing work where we may look at, for instance, an excitonic insulator, we have a small gap and you want to drive your system by pumping below or above the gap. So, on. so that's what hopefully you'll see in the next few months coming up. Now, this is all for, for graphite and graphene. Uh, the last couple of slides I'd like to show has to do with cuprates, which is, you know, the kind of uh, the, the more of a typical experiments I've been working on. And here is, so I'll just give you just a few uh, examples uh, of what we are doing and we've been doing. So here is work that was done by Alessandra Lanzara's group. Uh, also, uh, a, you know, uh, coming from uh, ZX's, uh, ZX's group, we were there as posted together, and uh, work on uh, BISCO, so the usual uh, bilayer uh, bismuth cuprate. And uh, what uh, this work was, was about looking at the dispersion of uh, the copper oxygen uh, plane band that comes and crosses the chemical potential, and then do an experiment equilibrium in black and uh, uh, time results, so at some delay in red. And what you see is that the, there is, you know, there's only one change in the spectrum, which is the suppression of the, of the, what we call the coherent way of the quasi-particle. So the suppression of intensity in the quasi-particle peak, in the peak of the spectrum. And, uh, and if you, and, you know, if you then take a difference, you have an increase above the F and a, and a depletion below the F. And so this was, you know, described in terms of a quasi-particle meltdown, uh, 
by by driving the system. So we wanted to look a bit more uh, in detail into this. And so we've done an experiment where now we use uh, the, the pump as a way to heat up our sample and do a very accurate time de temperature dependence on the same. So what I mean is, is shown here. So here you see two spectra. Uh, this is single layer BISCO and this is bilayer BISCO. So single layer BISCO, an overdub sample 24 Kelvin. And so we come in uh, and do a time resolve experiment. So this is uh, in blue, you see a spectrum done at 30 Kelvin. And then in red, you see the spectrum measured uh, at a given delay and now we can estimate the effective electronic temperature by doing basically a Fermi edge type analysis. We extract, you know, the broadening of that Fermi edge. And from that, we can infer what an effective electronic temperature is. So this, the, the sample was kept on a cryostat of the same base temperature, 30 Kelvin. However, once there is a pump on it, the effective electronic temperature goes to 90. And here you see your suppression of spectral weight very promptly. And, and now, now we do the same in BISCO and we actually, 2212, so the bilayer, and the question is, are we looking at something which is equivalent to temperature or not? So the symbols are now equilibrium for the emission data measure at those nominal temperature now, 30 and 90 without pump, only the probe. And so you can see they're actually quite equivalent. But using this trick, basically, we can convert a time dependence, so a delay between pump and probe into an effective electronic temperature. And so we can now go and plot the coherent spectral way, which is basically an integral of that uh, uh, spectral function done for when the momentum is the Fermi momentum. So we can quantify basically uh, the intensity in this peak. And we can actually, in fact, you know, we can estimate that and we can calculate the difference between uh, the, you know, we can calculate the difference in, uh, in coherent spectral way is shown here where, you know, the, uh, with a, a peak that shows the low temperature peak and the high temperature peak, that difference and plotted versus the electronic temperature. So basically we normalize this difference to one before, you know, very low temperature before the pump comes in. And then as the pump comes in and heats up the electron gas, we can see how the spectral weight uh, melts away and dies off. And we do it for bismuth 212 and we do it for bismuth 201. So bilayer BISCO and single layer BISCO. So basically what we're plotting here, the evolution of the Korean spectral wave is a function of temperature, but this temperature is not just the crust of temperature, it's the electronic temperature. And there is one first observation to make. All of the color bars here are the TCs of these samples. For the single layer BISCO, TC is even lower. And what you see is that the evolution is smooth and there is no direct relation to superconductivity. And again, one point to note is these are spectra measure along the node of the cupre where the superconducting gap is actually zero. So the, 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 you know, the diagonal direction, 45 degrees to the copper oxygen bond. So basically we have an evolution of spectral weight that does, has no relation to TC. So we can do a further analysis, which is to put all the data together and, uh, and uh, then generate uh, a curve, uh, which is the evolution of spectral weight we would extract from a Fermi liquid type analysis. And as you can see, there is a very good match between the two. Pretty much we take a self-energy for a Fermi liquid. We use that to do a global fitting of all of the data. Okay? So the two dimensional data sets that we have, meaning energy distribution curves, momentum distribution curves. From that, we can infer our alpha, uh, beta and gamma terms. We know the temperature, and then we can plot the resulting Fermi liquid type expectation for the suppression of spectral weight. And that's exactly what we have. So basically, this would suggest that you know, we see a suppression of spectral wave, uh, which is not related to superconductivity, but is really dominated by the quasi-particle dynamics of the, nor of the underlying normal state. The next step is to, or similar, uh, you know, in alternative and equivalent step to this one, is instead to look at the spectral wave at zero energy, at KF, just concentrate on that part. And that can be calculated for both Fermi liquid and marginal Fermi liquid. And so if we do that and we, and we concentrate on the two, you know, two best data set we have on this system, uh, then you can see that not only, you know, here you get a very good agreement with Fermi liquid, but you know, the question would be how, would be, how good would it be if instead of a Fermi liquid, you had a marginal Fermi liquid, where the key difference is, you know, a, 
a, a quadratic exponent versus a linear exponent. And now you see that if you do the analysis done at zero energy, the, the difference is large enough that you can tell the difference between the two. So if we look at the node of a cupre, we use the pump and probe as a way to um, excite our system and excite electron gas. And we can actually now do a temperature experiment to really see uh, what happens over a broader temperature scale very fast. Basically, this temperature range is scanning five minutes. And that's, that's just changing the delay between pump and probe. And so in five minutes, we do it. And then we repeat. And we go on for hours. So this way, we can have a very high statistics or a very broad temperature range and take care for, for instance, aging effect that would be typical in these experiments. I think I'm moving towards the conclusion. So I've not talked about that, but this is recent work that was also done by in my group a few years ago. And it, the idea was to go and look at the phase dime of cuprates, which is, you know, described te temperature versus doping, having a dome and having one side possibly dominated by phase coherent, the other side by pairing. And so we were asking the question, if you go and drive your system, you pump your system and you destroy superconductivity, how is that done? Is that done through the loss of phase coherence, meaning if you look at spectra, they should get broader and broader, or is it done through, uh, you know, the pairing, meaning the spectra, the peaks in the spectra across the gap should come closer to each other as the gap was closing. And we, we saw that the most of the action was in the phase coherence. And so basically from there, we conclude that in phase coherence, that, that it, this is a way, one way to demonstrate that phase coherence plays a major role in, in uh, in the emergence of superconductivity in the cuprates, at least on the underdope side of phase dark, for the overdope to be seen. Well, um, this brings me to the conclusion, but below, just before concluding, one more slide on uh, an idea. Oops, uh, here, my, my idea doesn't show up for some reason. I lost my idea, uh, just a second. See if I can get the idea back. Let's come on and see here. But no, oh, the idea is oh, there it is. So there is an idea of what one could do these days with these sources. And this is at this stage is a conceptual experiment. It's also a proposal that we submitted to the Canadian government, and it's a uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, with our collaborators. So we have uh, uh, in addition to myself, we have Paul Corkum, his uh, Viato second uh, you know Viato second. Uh, uh, leader in, in Canada, Ottawa, also involved with the Max Planck Center for quantum, for, for, for quantum optics in Ottawa. Uh, then we have Stefan Kaiser and, and Bernard Kaiman from, uh, from Max Planck Stuttgart, and we have, we have George Salatsky and a few other theories from, uh, from Vancouver. And the idea is the following, in photo emission, you know, usually we come in with a low photons, 10 EV, 20 EV. We have a system, we remove a single electron at a time, and we measure the kinetic energy and that uh, uh, momentum. Well, problem is, if your system is a many-body system, for instance, it's a superconductor, those electrons would belong to a Cooper pair wave functions, to a many-body wave function. But when you remove a single electron, you lose any information whatsoever about that internal structure of the wave function. What if you could come in with a 50 V photon now and photomate two electrons simultaneously and detect two electrons simultaneously? As you do that, now you have a chance of being able to see the inner structure of that wave function. Now, this of course requires a number of technological advances. First of all, you need to go in with a, a, a high, you know, a high photon energy. Second, in order to gain the sensitivity and the efficiency of acquisition, you, you know, you also have to use time of flight detection. That is what we believe. So basically, in order to be able to use time of flight detection, you need a pulse source. So you cannot use this 50 V coming from a synchrotron again, but you need to use lasers with a high enough photon energy, high enough temporal resolution, and be able to do a coincident experiment on an accurate enough time scale that you could see uh, two electrons coming in coincidence. And what you should expect in this case is that this inner structure of a wave function would be reflected in the angular distribution of the electrons. So for instance, if we take you know, the energy gap versus angle for a cuprate, we have a superconducting gap, which is D wave, we have a pseudo gap superimposed that which generates these exotic Fermi arcs, but pretty much you're looking at this momentum dependence for the gap itself, which means if you do an experiment uh, on a, and you remove a Cooper pair with two electron, they should live at opposite momentum of those Fermi surface. And so if you look in momentum or angle, 
your intensity should be uh, peaked very clearly on plus K and minus K. And as your system goes above the superconducting phase transition, so it goes into the normal state, and perhaps all you're left with is a pseudo gap, now the structure should be broadened. And if some of the structure would remain, I guess I would take it as an indication that the pseudo gap is a, a, a you know, a preform, a preformed version of pairing. Uh, if instead it goes completely flat, this, the pseudo gap would be something completely different. But this momentum structure is key. If you had, for instance, a charge density wave system, now the pairing between particles would happen with a total K that, for instance, would not be equal to zero, but it could be different from zero. So look at the angular distribution tells you really about the kind of interaction you have across the Fermi surface and therefore uh, about that inner structure of the wave function. And with this, I like to conclude and thank you all for your attention. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Andrea. I think uh, yeah, well, some of us will with the clap and be heard. Um, questions, comments? Yeah, so, so Andrea, I mean, I, I, I'm curious. So, so in, in your Cupid work, so you showed quite clearly that uh, this, uh, this gap is actually sort of a pseudo gap is actually uh, the, the, you have phase, phase coherence. Uh, the, yeah, the, this picture, yeah, the gap is actually opening uh, the, the above TC. I mean, do you, do you have any say in the case of a necktie if you try to use this method to do it? I mean, in the, say, for example, in the end of the regime, and does, uh, does the matter phase have anything to do with the gap? Well, we have not, so, so on the, on the, so let's say, so in order, even in a few, a couple of steps, you know, even in the Cupre mm -hmm. to see what the gap does above or below TC, uh, right. I think is, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need the time resolve work. I mean, they're basically, I mean, you could do it using the time as a way of, uh, you know, basically playing with the electronic temperature. So I could, Play with electronic temperature and see what the gap does. In this particular, but you could also just do it at equilibrium. In this particular case, we were using the the, the pump, really not right, so right. by the temperature, but to modify the spectral function. So basically, we have a spectral function into the system, and what we're trying to do with the pump is to see if we are creating particle excitations, and those particle excitations will have to relax down, uh, mm -hmm. basically interacting with bosons in the system. And then asking the question, what is being affected the most? Is the delta or is the gamma? And what gotcha. is that actually, yeah, the gamma is the one that is affected the most. So gamma mm -hmm, both mm -hmm. drives the system out of superconductivity and recovers. The gap actually hardly changes, about a 10% change. But so this is a bit of a very specific situation where we are driving the system away from equilibrium. Temperature is not changing so much in this case. We're pumping very gently. Number wise, we're looking at microjoule. Uh, per square centimeter. So we're pumping very gently and, and then the system immediately uh, loses phase coherence. So uh, we, we have not done similar experiments on the iron arsenides yet is uh, in the, you know, that's something we're planning on doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reason why is because uh, what we, so in this case, this experiment was done at 6 CV photon energy. So mm -hmm. we get to the nodal direction. And now we are going to go to the XUV and expand into the into the antinodal, or so to the zone boundary where the gap is large. Actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these data were taken very close to the to the nodal, so just off nodal, let's say. In the iron arsenides, really, we would have liked to you know to look at polar electron pockets, so look at both the gamma but also the zone boundary. So we are waiting to be able to do it on the XUV laser. Uh, I see. I see. Okay. And one thing I didn't mention is that we just moved into a new building a year ago or so, so we just rebuilt everything. So uh, we just rebuilt everything and the lab is now almost fully operational. So the 6CV is again operational. The XUV is now connected and we expect lighting to the chamber before the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Um, question. Andrew, I had a question about this. Uh, oh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll proceed and we have time. Uh, the, the thermoliquid behavior across the doping. Uh, yeah. So, Let's see, what, what do I think about this uh, relaxation rate? Is it is the usual nodal normal state type of relaxation rate that's been observed? Yes, I would, I would basically, so basically I think the, the situation is the following in the, you know, the, the context is, uh, is uh, there's been of course a lot of work done, conventional temperature dependence on uh, in, in uh, photomission, right? Trying to extract these quantities. <clears throat> 
So the, the, and usually if you get data similar to this one, let's say it's always hard to define whether it is a T cube or T squared type dependence mm -hmm. that dominates this. And uh, I think the advantage here is, uh, and, and it then becomes uh, you know, complicated and analysis. The advantage here was to have enough data to do a, a, a comprehensive ana analysis simultaneously. So, uh, but also look at it in two ways. One is a more conventional Fermi liquid type analysis. The other one is really to look at the zero frequency spectral wave and see how that goes. So is this combination of the two. But yes, this would be the, the scattering rate for the no quasi particles. And the key information is that you do not see any real connection to TC. So no anomaly at TC, but this is really the normal state type evolution. What is missing here, or what I, you know, the next question I would have is, how does this scattering, you know, the, the, this evolution change, uh, this temperature dependence change as you go from the node towards the anti node? Mm -hmm. There are terms which are deviating from, from a Fermi liquid a type description coming up or not. Uh, so that is really what I, so uh, right now I think is, uh, there is work that was done by Peter Johnson on this, uh, for instance, before with the detailed temperature dependence. And it wasn't particularly conclusive on whether T squared TQ, uh, uh, sorry, T linear tie dependency. Actually, sorry, in this case, it was debating between T squared and TQ. So I think we can tell the difference between T squared and TQ, but also between T squared and T linear in this case. I think this is in, in a situation like this one is pretty, pretty convincing. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, maybe if I step back and ask maybe a slightly broader question, yeah. if I want to look for potential quantum critical type of features in these uh, time dependent or time resolved uh, spectroscopy, has there some, been some effort uh, along this direction? Well, um... Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think you're, I guess you're thinking of maybe fermions or or or, or even just in the cook plate, say you know near optimal doping versus uh, away from it. Yeah, perhaps I, I uh, perhaps I guess uh, you know I guess basically one would have to do this. Well, I was thinking a heavy fermion because or, you know a system where you there is a okay. Unfortunately, in those cases, most of the quantum critical point come in a finite field, right? So ideally, I'd like to have a, a, a very clear cut case where I can see that here, presumably this should show up at some particular doping, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. From what we see, uh, and what we have here now is in terms of accuracy, I don't think we would have enough to, to say, right? Mm -hmm. Basically we are analyzing all the data sets together mm -hmm. in this case, uh, and the behavior seems to be consistent. So ideally I would be looking around, you know, a 20% uh, dope system. Uh, so, you know, just around, you know, optimal doping, but we don't, I don't think we have a statistic, certainly not in this data to make that statement. Mm -hmm. But in principle, I guess you could, yes. Yeah. So one thing we're working on uh, and that we'd like to do is really try to uh, do a, a longer Fermi surface, right? Because it might be that at the node, you don't see it and, mm -hmm. and it's maybe at other places. So do this work along the Fermi surface and try to connect to what you really see in transport. So that is the kind of thing we're going for. And so this is where it does involve a Louis type affair and mm -hmm. also Brad Ramshaw. So with them, and in fact, even there, we are starting with simpler system to see if we can make that correspondence, establish a very direct quantitative correction between transport and this kind of analysis, and then go from there. So it's something we're planning. Mm -hmm. At this stage here, we don't see that difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I mean, for instance, the optimally phosphor stoped uh, barrier one to two, there's all the indications of oh, quantum criticality of a substantial. Mm -hmm. Temperature window. It might it might be interesting too. Okay. Yeah. That. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so any other, I think Doug had a question. Yeah. Yeah. I just just before I go and prepare for my class. Um, very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Re quick question on exactly the slide that you're showing now. So, over what time scale? Like, what was the what was the pump probe delay time in this? And I, the reason I ask is that I'm a little, depending on the answer you give, I guess I'm a little surprised that 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 that, that essentially it thermalized effectively thermalized carriers are a really great description over the whole range. Ah, I mean, at some point on some short time scale, these things haven't had enough time to to scatter, right? And it's actually I meant to put this light in, I forgot. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this, these are, so first of all, here you're looking at when we say 30 sec, uh, 30 Kelvin, 
This is, I think, about one or two picoseconds after. And, yeah. uh, and so the system now is thermalized. There is certainly a non-thermal regime. Okay, and we have done, to look at a non-thermal regime, uh, we have done a very detailed analysis on the graphite. So the graphite data really offer you uh, the, the possibility of looking at what is called a non-thermal window. And I think is, uh, uh, is you know, there are no clear examples uh, in the literature because I think this is a field which is uh, quickly developing. But yeah, if you look at the, uh, at, at, at the graphite work that we have done, which is coming out in PRB, it's a long paper. Basically, we, we use a Boltzmann type analysis to look to simulate the spectra and see what, what happens. And yeah, you do have a, a non-thermal window close to the chemical potential where effectively, you know, we basically you get into this uh, uh, paradox where you have extremely, if you like, hot pho phonons in the system, but the electronic temperature is still very low. So the system is not thermalized yet. Okay. Yeah, and you can see different phases. Basically, you can see, and we can do an, an analysis where we see the three different regimes into this as a function of fluence of the pump and delay that you wait. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, I forgot to put this light in yesterday. I, I, yeah, it was too late. So but we've yeah. Done, we've done transport experiments historically in, in, in just, I mean, little, even little small metal junctions where it's pretty clear that you can have, I was thinking more the other direction where you can have steady state even. You can have some, you know, some number of, of carriers that, that really, I mean, it takes a little while for carriers to decide that they're really thermally distributed and, you know, and b before they talk to the lattice, right? That's right. So I think in, in, in one thing we really like to do in this case is uh, what's, it's what I was showing the last slide is, uh, is uh, you know, use a, the pump energy, be able to tune the pump energy so that you can play with different states and see how things change. So I, I think you, you can have many different regimes. In that particular experiment, we had a situation where uh, what was, was very obvious was close to EF, the time it takes for system to thermalize there, and then the, all the bottleneck effects that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think there is a lot to explore on that. So if you're interested in that, it's the same person who, well, it's, it's on the archive now, this paper. Okay, great. We'll do Thank that you. work, yeah. Uh, okay. Any other I questions? have a few questions. Yeah, thank you, Andrea, for this really interesting talk. I have a, uh, a few questions. One is about the slide. So I, I think I noticed the, un, the spectral weight under the EDC is not conserved. Do you think that? It actually, yeah, it, but it is. Uh, it is in a sense that this is a single slide, it's a single EDC. So if you look, uh, I don't have a figure here. It does look like it's not. So actually, let me tell you a little bit of history. When I saw Alessandra's data uh, back then, right, I was really puzzled. And I asked, have you normalized data in some funny way? I don't know. Uh, and I had the same question. Why is it not conserved? Uh, so this data have not been normalized. That is also an advantage of the time resolved work. You pretty much, because this, this spectrum has been measured in, uh, you know, within five, not, not even five minutes of each other. And so there's no normalization going on. And it looks like it's not concerned. But if you, instead of uh, looking at the single EDCs, you, you, you also look at the MDC or you take into account there is some broadening also in momentum, which, you know, you may take as, hey, there must be some momentum dependence on this self energy, even though weak, but there must be, then it is concerned. So in the paper, which is on the archive, in the supplementary material, you can see that analysis. I see, because I, I think I've heard there was some evidence that there's some spectral weight transfer that's momentum dependent, not in a time resolved way, but in, just in conventional RPs. Uh, well, it's always a question, right? So basically, I think if you if you look at the self energy here, uh, you know, this uh, self energy should also be a, a function of K, the marginal Fermi liquid type approach was assuming a very weak and linear dependence on that too. So depending on depending on the kind of model you use, you may or may not have that dependence mm -hmm. in there. Experimentally, uh, you know, if I look at the Cupre anti-node and node, right? Mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. that strategy has to be very different. Yeah. And so then there gotta be a list and momentum dependence of that. So for instance, if you look in terms of electron form coupling you expect for the nodal quasi particles versus the anti-nodal, you're coupling to different terms, different phonons. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would really expect that the de dependence to be there. That's why I'm saying it would really be nice to go all along the Fermi surface. Locally, mm -hmm. uh, we can see that there is conservation of spectral weight in a range of angles, which is not very large. So now the question is whether you're describing in terms of a, K a very weak K-dependence of energy or not, but I would expect a bigger one. 
So I would say that implicitly based on the spectra, how they change and the couplings that you see in this system varies. Are we able to follow it? I don't quite, uh, you know, I don't know if we yet have, uh, uh, if we did, you know, then we would know everything about the cell phenogen, but we, I don't think we were there yet. I just, if I could, I have two more questions. One is that, do you think, uh, uh, you think there are other processes like during this time, like how far can you carry the analogy that this is a thermal, like when you do type pump probe, that is, it's, it's mostly a thermal effect. Ah, this uh, it really depends. So basically the way we approach this is, is uh, a bit agnostic. So we go, so what we do effectively, we have data, let's say we take data along the node and off, mm -hmm. right? Along the node, which is what we have here. But if I go, we, we have a well-defined, we then go and integrate these uh, EDCs, the, all the spectra along the node perpendicular to the Fermi surface. We generate what Van der Sar will call a tomographic density of state. So it's basically a density of state, but it's measured not in, along the entire Fermi surface, averaging the entire Fermi surface, but only the cut that goes through the node. So when we do that, we actually get a, a well-defined Fermi edge. Or going back to the question we were asked before, do we get a, a well-defined Fermi edge? Yeah, well, initially not. So there is no thermalization, you know, in the first, uh, let's say, 100 frames a second, but then we do. So, or 50, 50 depending on the system, really, and the dope. So once we have a well-defined Fermi edge, we can extract an electronic temperature. And so in this case, what we do, we pump hard enough that we take the electronic temperature up to 100 Kelvin. In the case of uh, when we look at the at this data here, in this case, the electronic temperature, we were pumping very gently. And what you see here, you see that you have, you start off with a well-defined gap, and then mm -hmm. you go at some delay later, that's a 600 picos, a femtosecond later, the gap has not changed, but the broadening has changed a lot and there is spectral way inside the gap. So this is what we would say, oh, there is a, a broadening for, uh, you know, coming from the uh, pair breaking scattering rate. And, uh, and then you ask what's happening to the gap itself. Well, the gap has changed by 10%. And then you can look at the temperature. These data are taken uh, off node, but at the same time, we have the nodal data. And there you can see that the temperature has gone from, you know, 20, 30 Kelvin to 60 Kelvin at the most. And this is an optimally doped coupe, or in case, this case is under dope, and, you know, but we have data on the optimally dope. And if you look at how the gap would change, uh, it's not a lot. At most is of the order of 10%. So mm -hmm. basically we, we have to do it. So if the only way I can <clears throat> I know is to do an analysis of something that if you have a Fermi edge, do an analysis of the Fermi edge at least to see whether you have an effective electronic temperature, which is mimicking a Fermi edge or not. If I could, sorry, last question is that this is the technique that introduces two uh, electron uh, photo emission that is re really interesting in the end. Can I ask, um, do you expect, what is the cross section of that process compared to conventional like single, like during that experiment, would you, how would you estimate? So, well, you basically are saying, uh, well, I guess, I guess the question really depends a lot on uh, on, you know, what are you, what are you after? Like it, it, this data sets, for instance, right? In this data sets, we're really working close to the chemical potential, right? So we're right there. So then the cross-section area is, uh, I mean, basically is the same as this, the equilibrium fluid emission experiment. Uh, you see that we measure data above EF, right? Uh, and this is nothing to do with the thermal broadening. You know, th this is not because so, we are exciting electrons 1.5 dB by the F, and then they relax down. So this is just sensitivity. Um, so here is just measuring for a long time, you know, just measuring for a long time. And uh, and we're so sorry, it, it is thermal browning, sorry in a way, but it's not that we have populated this state by the with the photon. Okay. So but when you go and look at uh, graphite and you're looking at 0.6 CV above EF. Similar to what uh, they have done in the axis group, when you look at the topological insulator, now you really have, you know, a very low population, a very low density. So I would say the, the cross section is the same as far as probability of photo emission, but it's the density that you have there is extremely weak. And the faster they relax down, the lower the density of the electrons that you can photo emit. So that's why I'm saying in the case of graphite, you're looking 0.6 CV by the F, and you're uh, you're looking at a signal which is four order of magnitude less than what you measure at EF. Okay. So now, depending on the lifetime of the states and uh, the, the transition probability you have, 
you can sort of guess what the what the probability of getting an electron out of there is going to be, and it's very it's going to be very low. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, that's uh, very illuminating. Um, I think we should end at this point. Thanks uh, once again, Andrea, for a very nice talk. Thank you. Good. So. Uh,